Today's video is brought to you by Card Kingdom. And right now you can get this sweet scoop soldier sticker. When you order over at cardkingdom.com, just mention in your order notes that you want a scoop soldier sticker when you go to check out. Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and we got a super special video today. For the last few days, we've been breaking down the impact on Ikoria in various constructed formats, and it is time for one of my favorite formats. We are talking top 10 Ikoria cards for modern today, and like usual, I got a co-host today, and that is Krim. Krim, are you ready for Modern Day? Oh, yes, I am. Uh, yes, I'm actually really hyped for this set in Modern. Uh, there are some cards that I think are really powerful, maybe even broken. We're, we're definitely past the stage of Magic sets where sometimes you get a set and there's like two cards that are like kind of semi-interesting for Modern and then a bunch of stuff that you're like, eh, probably no one will actually play this, but I got to round out my top 10 list. Yeah. I think we got a really solid list of cards that actually have a shot in the form and some of the top cards on the list, good lord, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with these cards in the format. So I'm hyped for today. Uh, before we get into it, a couple of reminders. We are not adding the land cycle to our list today. I think it probably would have made the list. I don't think it'd be number one on my list, but I do think that the land cycle from Ikoria could see some play, but we've excluded those because they're a little boring, even though they are good and they are fetchable. And also, this is our combined list. Uh, me and Krim each made a list. Mash it together for the video. If you want to see our individual lists, you could do so in the article uh, over on the website. So check that out if you're interested. But anyway, Krim, let's count down the top 10 Ikoria cards for my Modern, starting with maybe a sleeper planeswalker, one we haven't really seen anyone talking about. Number 10 on our list, Luca Copperco Outcast. So I think we both like this card, but for different reasons. Yeah. Uh, so I am excited about polymorphing with Luca, the negative two ability where you can exile a creature you control and then reveal cards to you, hit a creature with higher converted mana cost, put it into play. What I envision with Luca is playing a deck that all of your creatures are either one CMC mana dork, so like Arbor Elves, Birds of Paradises, uh, those type of effects, and then your only other creature being Emrakul the Eon Storm, trying to ramp into Uka, uh, to Luca on like turn three and just turning a random Arbor Elf or whatever into the Emrakul, Emrakul winning the game. So that's my uh, level of interest in Luga, but Krim, you had a kind of a different idea about what Luka could do in modern. See, like it's funny that Luka shows up here and not in Pioneer Standard, but for for, for me, I think the the Luka, the what I saw for Luka was the the uh, Utopia sprawl decks, the green red monster decks. I think this minus two can turn like maybe a a random Llanowar elf into like an Inferno Titan or a Storm Breath Dragon. I actually think this is a very good card for just the fair game, right? And like on top of that, it's we're playing Blood Moon and things like that. So naturally, you know, like this it being in red is perfect. And it ults very quickly. So like like even just having a field of little mana dorks probably will still kill your opponent if you ult. Because it deals its damage equal to power, uh, equal to its power to each opponent. So I just like this as a fair mid range green red monsters card. And the monsters decks, they actually are very creature heavy. Usually outside of creatures, they're playing like some blood moons, maybe like, like stone evil. rain. Yeah, or yeah. But they, there, there might be pillage in there depending on the build. Uh, depending, some of them are like more Ponzi with lots of land destruction. Some of them it's just pillage. But they usually have 20 plus creatures in those decks, which means the plus one on Luka actually has some value. Like you probably are actually going to be drawing extra cards similar to you would with like Chandra Torture Defiance, uh, except you have a little bit of maybe extra flexibility if you can keep Luka around, which coming in with five loyalty going up to six right away means it's probably going to stick around for a turn or two. So I kind of like the card draw aspect aspect for those decks too because those decks do tend to empty their hand pretty quickly you got yeah. the arbor elf the utopia sprawl yep. so you just kind of dump out your hand and then you are hoping to find that inferno titan or whatever to close out the game sometimes the plus one could be a solution to that problem in those that's always been the problem style decks too yeah yeah like see that's been my problem playing those decks like it's just like card selection like oftentimes okay i've done my thing i've got all my my mana dorks i've got all this stuff out but i just keep drawing lands Right? Like, I don't have a way to actually kill you now, and by the time I do, like, I'm already too far behind. But this plus one does solve that issue like you had mentioned. 
And for sure, the minus two will get you something. That'll get you something, and the ultimate probably going to win you the game most of the time as well. So, yeah, I think Luca's a card that people maybe uh, got to give another look in modern, and that brings it in at number ten on our list. But let's move on to number nine on our list. <laughs> Coming in at number nine on our list, we have uh, the little fairy dragon, the sprite dragon. Krim, I know you love fairies. Is this going into your fairy deck? <laughs> I guess now I have a reason for Grixis fairies. So, <laughs> sh- but I actually know because we're still casting a lot of creatures, right? So I don't know this. We were talking about this a little before, but like, I feel like this card should be higher, right? Like, but I feel like both you and I have gotten burnt too many times on the previous iterations before it, right? We've had Storm Chaser Mage, who you would think, okay, blue red spells deck, love these type of cards. But the fact that that card had prowess and this gives a permanent plus one plus one counter, that's pretty relevant, right? And it's a non-creature spell, so that's great. It doesn't have to be something like instant sorcery. I, I don't know, like, should this card be higher? But I feel like it's I actually feel like that for me this should be number 10 and Luca would be higher. Just because cards like these very rarely make as big of a spell, like a big of an impact on the format as you would think it would. I, yeah, I think that's a really good way to put this. When I saw Sprite Dragon, I was like, okay, this seems like something that probably going to be good in modern. They got Manamorphosis, you got Gut Shots, you got all these cheap spells, it's going to get huge, it kill people. And while it definitely can do that, the history of Storm Chaser Mage just not <laughs> really ever becoming a real card like yes it shows up in like random decks once in a while but it's never really solidified (laughs) itself as a top tier card in the format that makes me nervous about sprite dragon is the upside of getting a permanent counter compared to starting with some extra toughness and just having prowess is that enough to make sprite dragon a thing Uh, we'll have to see the other like little bit of upside is you know it does trigger on any non-creature spell which is nice i don't know i uh, Lava I Dart like is in card. the format. That's the issue, right? Like, at least the other one doesn't die to Lava Dart, but, yeah. you know, it's not and permanent. Gut shot. Yeah, and Gutshot. So, like, ah. but it's like, if, but it seems cool, right? Because, like, now may- maybe Storm Chaser Mage and this go into this blue red spells deck, and now is the time. I mean, it does seem like if you just have, like, your Swift Spear, Soul Scar Mage, Sprite Dragon, uh, along with Storm Chaser, and then just overload your deck with a bunch of cheap or even free spells, like, it seems like you should be able to kill people really quickly. So maybe that redundancy is what the deck needs. Just having, maybe that's the problem. We didn't have enough Storm Chaser. Yeah, mages. yeah. If maybe we only really? had more Storm Chaser Mages, it would <laughs> be a real modern card (laughs) and now we do so it may be Uh, anyway let's move on to another two drop in another two color combination kinnon bonder of prodigy coming in or bonder prodigy not of prodigy coming in at number eight (laughs) on our list so uh krim what do you think about uh kinnon ning in the modern format what do you think of astrolabe (laughs) and how good astrolabe already is astrolabe is uh is pretty powerful Okay, so now Astrolabe does more. Like, it does more, right? Why not? So this card seems like at its, pro- probably at its best here, right? Or and in, in, in any deck that can really take advantage of Astrolabe and stuff like that, or, or Mox Amber even, right? Like, any of those. Uh, we're talking, like, it can get pretty wild here. So, I don't know. This This card seems like it could be pretty busted actually in modern the more i think about everything that taps that's a non-land permit that taps for mana like holy cow yeah i think that's the scary part about kinnon in modern is you got the mana dorks you got the noble hierarchs and birds of paradises but unlike standard and unlike even pioneer you actually have some pretty good mana rock type stuff you mentioned astrolabe all of a sudden that's producing mana rather than just filtering mana you got random moxen that are floating around in the format so this feels like it can do some scary things the other thing that makes kinnon i think more scary in modern is you actually have non-humans that if you hit them with that seven mana ability like uh, let's say <laughs> like Emrakul or grizzle Barand or something essentially just win the game when they uh the next turn after they come into play so it doesn't seem like that big of a stretch that you could build a deck where you use kinnon's mana producing ability to ramp into seven mana really quickly and then spin off the top of your deck just ridiculously overpowered threats into play yeah like i'm just thinking of like all the hornet queens the primeval titans 
You know what I mean? Like there's there's lots of stuff there that you could probably be playing. Like who knows, right? Like there's there's lots of non-human threats that you really don't want to see. Unless you're the person and, who has them. Yeah, exactly. And because of the ramp ability, you can actually cast those cards pretty easily. Like you can ramp into Primeval Titan or Hornet Queen. And then if you don't have them in hand because you're all mana dorks and mana rocks, then you can just spin Ken and try to find them. So it's kind of this self-contained army in a can type card as well to some extent. Yeah. Well, let's move further along our list and i know Krim, i know this is <laughs> this is a seth card yariad sky no bad i am the, the every one video person. every video <laughs> this card is so high on the list here <laughs> well in, in my defense it's only number seven on the modern That's list way but too I'm, high. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was not on on Krim's list at all so i am the person that's banging the <laughs> the yarian drum i think this card's busted i think starting with extra card in your hand is busted i I think that there could be control decks, maybe blink style decks, Amiria style decks, Wall of Omens style decks that can take advantage of Yarion in the format. So uh, <laughs> I think this card's going to be good. I think it's going to change how people build decks. I think people are going to be, I don't know, wanting it to be banned because they're seeing it too often in the format, something like that. So I know we have very different opinions, but uh, we will we will wait and see. We will I... wait and see what happens with Yarion. And uh, but we'll modern see. modern is the format. <laughs> where you need your sideboard cards right <laughs> like like you're, you're you're not only down a slot in your sideboard but like on top of that you have 80 cards in your deck <laughs> so you please don't say serum visions is better than op so you can more likely find your cards because that's not true <laughs> Like, I guess now you don't have to worry. You play both Serum Visions and Opt because you're going to play 80 cards. But, like, I just, I feel like Modern, the 80 cards thing is a very serious drawback. Standard, maybe even Pioneer, sure, you can get away with it there. But, like, Modern, I don't know. And, like, are there enough things that I, that you really want to blink to truly abuse this? Like, I mean, like, like, what, what would you be blinking? Please don't say Mole Drifter. <laughs> Please don't say Mole Drifter. <laughs> Cloud Blazer. <laughs> okay, I guess you didn't say Mole Drifter. So. <laughs> I did not say Mole Drifter. No, seriously, though, maybe Wall of Omens. Uh, that seems like an, <laughs> an easy thing. To, you put up your defenses. You even have Wall of Blossoms if you want to go into Bant. Okay. Think of all the cards you will draw, all the defense you'll play. That's an easy way to up your, your card count. And then you get a 4-5 or five that just beats your opponent down in the air. Like That gets through Delver Secrets. Not going to stop. It. What flyer in modern is actually <laughs> shutting down Yarion once it hits the battlefield? Okay, okay. I guess it can rule the skies, right? Like it can rule the skies. You have that much, unless there's a bigger sprite dragon or something. But like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Seth. I I don't know. Like I'm 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 usually with you. You know, I can ride with you, like on some of the <laughs> some of the cars. But this might be a little bit too deep for me. <laughs> All right, we will we will revisit this next set when we do our top 10 countdown right, and we'll see right. we will see remind us chat to yes. uh to talk yari on next set and we'll see where it actually uh <laughs> turned uh. out <laughs> all right let's move let's move on from the world of companions to the world of cheap graveyardy cards in fiend artisan Krim, i know you weren't a big uh yari on fan but what about fiend artisan how do you feel about this one in modern oh i already like this in pioneer and we are like, dude, this, this card is amazing in modern, right? How easy is it for us to load our yard up? We were complaining about cards like, you know, Hogak, right? But okay, so Hogak had trample. Don't get me wrong. Delve, obviously a very good mechanic, but I feel like it's not absolutely out of this world for a fiend artisan to be around the power and toughness of, of Hogak, right? It just won't be able to trample over, but that's okay because instead of trampling over, we get to sack something and then look and then look through our deck. And put it onto the battlefield. I mean, like yeah. you can find another fiend artisan if you want, or or yeah, like we were just talking about how modern is a sideboard important format, right? Well, cool. I went and found I don't know my y Yixla Jailer or something like that. Yeah, I think that is probably the biggest upside is how important sideboard cards are to being successful in modern and being able to snag uh, your Yixla Jailer, being able to say snag a Collector Oof against the Artifact deck, being able to snag a, a Fulminator Mage against Tron. There's so many Silver Bullet type cards where a single Fiend Artisan activation to get that one of that you had in your sideboard can potentially just shift the entire game in your favor. Yeah. Plus, as you mentioned, 
you can fill your graveyard really quickly. We're talking modern here. There's dredge decks. There's venge find decks. There's a lot of decks that just massively dump creatures into their graveyard. So Hogak is not a unfair goal for your fiend artist and getting up to an 8-8 or a 10-10 and doing that really early in the game. And then that's a really big, scary creature that can kill people. So I think it's that bigness combined with the flexibility, especially in sideboarded games that can make fiend artists in into maybe like a, a modern staple even. I think this card could be very, very good. Agreed. It definitely earns its mythic title here. Well, speaking of cards that might see a bit of play in modern, <laughs> I was going to say Ooh. mythic, but Luris is actually not a mythic for some reason. We're talking about Luris of the Dream Den, another companion. And I know, Krim, you were not a fan of uh, Yarion, the last companion we <laughs> talked about. What about Luris? Do you think Luris could be the companion that does some things in the modern format. I feel like Luris of the Dream Den was made for modern. <laughs> like modern and old and like formats older than that. Uh it's three mana and it's just like like you don't even have to actually do the companion part. I think it, just this on its own, a three two life link where on my turn I get to cast one permanent spell with CMC two or less from my yard, like that's amazing. I like like let, let's let's think here. We could play like we keep playing Croxa or something like that. We get a Tarmogoy if we can get Dark Confidants. I mean, naturally, a lot of the cards I have just mentioned are in Jund, but let's talk about uh, maybe maybe something like Hate Bears or something like that. Death and Taxes. You can get back your your Thalias, you know, your your Tide Hollow Scholars. So there's a lot that you can do in Modern, and this card is amazing because of it. Like like you don't you don't even have to use the companion part of it. Yeah, I think that is. I think there could be some decks that maybe meet the companion restriction. Uh, maybe the easiest of the tier decks might be a Death Shadow build. Like if you give up Street Wraith, you could actually play this as your companion. Some of those decks have Thought Scours and stuff to fill the graveyard, so that could be a possibility. But I think I think of this card a lot like Emery Lurker of the Lock, especially in the modern format. And uh, with cards like Emery, we see like Mishra's Bobble being the one of the easiest combos. Just this zero mana artifact that draws you a card every turn. <laughs> Even just casting that again and again and again to draw an yeah. extra card, that's a pretty big deal in the modern format. And that doesn't even include like some of the other homes. Like maybe Kethis combo could actually take Ooh. advantage of it. It is legendary. It lets you recast like a Mox Amber or something. Affinity. Or, or, yeah, <laughs> fin- there's like a lot of places that could take advantage of Luris. So while I wouldn't be surprised to see some decks figure out a way to play it as companion, I think that as a three drop, it is strong enough on its own to show up in modern. Anyway, let's move on to number four on our list. And number four on our list, Krim, you're gonna have to uh you're gonna have to talk about this one. This is one I actually did not have on my list at all. Whirlwind of Thought. And then the more I talk to you about it, the more I think you convince me that this card might not just be good, but it might actually be like busted in modern. So tell us about Whirlwind of Thought in modern. Maybe this is my Yoria or whatever <laughs> that companion is, but Okay, so this isn't on any list of mine, like, out, outside of modern, right? Like, it's not in my standards, not in my pioneer, but that's because I think in modern, this is where this card really shines. We have so many non-creature spells that are cheap, so, like, a Serum Visions can just be a draw to, like, you could bring this out of the sideboard of a control deck, but, like, there are so many ways to break this in, in this format between the Storm decks, uh, like, like, pretty much you look at this and you already know, you probably can picture, I don't know, 10 cards or 10 decks that are already going to break this card. It's just a simple, nothing crazy, but it's just you draw a card when you cast a non-creature spell. And that is amazing in Modern because we have so many things like free spells, like we have gut shots, lava darts, things like that. So, I don't know, maybe you even get, like, you go Boros Burn, right? And you, like, splash blue randomly, and this is kind of like your late game. You could fire off bolts that just kind of keep feeding into maybe other bolts. Uh, your lava darts in the yard now draw you a card. I can definitely see the potential. Like, we're talking about modern. It is the format where it seems like half the decks play Manamorphos. And yeah. cards like Manamorphos with Whirlwind of Thoughts are just extremely powerful. Just getting to draw two cards instead of one card. And then we have Storm style decks, as you mentioned, that could potentially play something this. Or like Jeskai Ascendancy style combo decks that are built around casting a whole bunch of cards in one turn. Uh, this reminds me a lot of Song of Creation, a card that we've ranked yep. highly on several lists and might still uh, come up on our list today, but you 
you get rid of the drawback, essentially. There's no punishment for not winning the turn that you cast yeah. a Whirlwind of Thoughts. You can just run this out, pass the turn, and, uh, and get some incremental value out of it, which is much harder to do with Song of Creation because of the discard your hand clause. Of course, Song of Creation does give you two cards whenever you cast any spell instead of one card when you cast a non-creature spell but in the decks that have a lot of non-creature spells this is a really steady source of card advantage and I'm almost curious if this could just see you play in like a control style shell or some sort of like spell heavy mid-range style deck where you're just kind of like doing your thing and casting your cryptic commands and your teferis and they're all coming with a kicker of draw an extra card which if you're playing a control deck that's kind of exactly what you want yeah like Jeskai control is already burning your opponents out, right? Like, imagine just going, like, electrolyze, draw two cards. Or or even better, you start playing something like Aria of the Flame, right? And on that, you just you just kind of go wild, right? Your opponent gains 10 life, but now you're just doing even more, and you're a- able to go through your deck fully. Aria of the Flame out, you just start burning them down with every spell you cast. Every spell you cast draws a card. If it's opt, whatever. If Serum Visions is drawing you two cards, dealing more damage. I don't know. I think, like, Whirlwind of Thought seems right at home in modern. Yeah, I agree. I I think you have me convinced that this actually has a little more potential than I initially gave it credit for. But let's move on to what might be the highest floor card on our list. Number three on our list, General Kudro. General Kudro, <laughs> I would be literally shocked if this did not see play in Modern. Modern already has five color humans as a deck, so we can cast humans of any converted mana cost, of any color combination. That's not a problem for the Modern Humans deck. And this actually feels like it does a lot of things that Modern Humans would want. It pumps your team. That's fine. I don't yep. think that would get it there by itself. Exiling cards from the graveyard. There's a lot of graveyard decks. Uro's oh, like yeah. the number one card in the format right now, or one of the top cards in the format. Getting rid of that's a big deal. There's dredge decks. There's snapcaster mage decks. So that is very relevant. And then the removal is just an added bonus. I don't know how many they play. I don't know if it's main deck or sideboard, but I would be literally shocked if Modern Humans was not playing some number of general Kudros. But Krim, uh, what do you think about it? I think it's amazing, right? Like, I mean, like this, this is definitely going into like the humans deck. I mean, Think about it. You Ether Vial, activate in response to the Snapcaster. Like, ah, oh, that's so, that's just such a blowout, right? Like, like it, it, it's, this card has so many applications and like the, on top of that, it's an Anthem effect. And you know what? You have a bunch of like humans and there's something brick walling you. Sure. Now you have a way to get rid of it. Like a, there, a Titan before it gets to swing before, you know what I mean? Like there's, there's lots you can do with this card. Cause like after you have your vial, oftentimes you're not even using your lands, right? You're just sitting there. So like you're, you're using vial, you're flashing them in and now you can flash them in, mess with their graveyard and use that open mana, to just like blow up some stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it actually, it's going to be, uh, it's going to see play in modern because it's a human and there's a ready built home, but I think it actually does a lot of unique things that the human deck wants. So it's not just seeing play because of its creature type. It actually has a, a couple of abilities that seem very powerful in the format. Agreed. And uh, let's keep moving on. Number two on our list. <laughs> Titan's Nest. <laughs> Titan's Nest. I think we've talked about this card in every format, and there's some reasons to think that Modern might actually be its best format, with the biggest one being Modern is the fetch land format. So if you're a card that cares about just any random card being in the graveyard, fetch lands are a really easy way to up that count. And we've seen Dig Through Time, Treasure Cruise, literally banded Modern specifically for that interaction. Titan's Nest basically turns everything into Dig Through Time or Treasure Cruise. So what do you think, Grim? How powerful can Titan's Nest be in a format with fetch lands? Oh, I think it could be amazing. I mean, I'm thinking already of like, like we, we saw for a while, we saw Sultai Reclamation decks, right? And they were using Nexus of Fate and stuff like that. But like, now you can just be like a Sultai control deck. And I'm thinking about where like Cryptic Command costs just triple blue, like Archmage's Charm costs, right? Uh, obviously all of that still gets Veil of Summered, but like the thing here is, I, I just think there's so many applications for this card. I, I, it can go in multiple styles of decks, right? Like, it can go into a combo deck. It can go into a mid-range deck. It can go into, you know what I mean? Like, it can go into a control deck. 
I don't know. There's there's a lot to be said here for this card because of fetch land. Yeah, fetch lands are really what makes it all possible, I think, with the cards like Titan's Nest. And it's really easy to fill your graveyard even outside of fetch lands. There's plenty of ways to just do that dredge cards and stitcher suppliers and all that kind of stuff. I don't know the perfect home for this card. It's one of those cards, though, that feels like it has a power level that will probably, uh, probably get it there when someone figures out the right cards to play it with. I mean, you got lots of extra turn spells, being able to cast like time warps for two mana and then cast some other stuff to keep your graveyard full and kind of combo off. You can play Jace's for two mana. You can play uh, big expensive stuff. There's a ton of ways to take advantage of this. And I think for me, really, if there's one thing we've learned about modern, it's that elf <laughs> cards are broken in the format and a card that just gives all of your non X colored spells delve it has to be good i i don't even yeah. know if it needs any like specific synergy like just doing <laughs> that we have like gurmag gurmag angler is kind of like a staple of the format we see cards like that seeing play which is about as watered down of a delve spell as you can possibly have like as safe as it gets and that's a card that sees a decent amount of play in modern i have to imagine that turning all your cards into gurmag anglers and dig through times and treasure cruises it's got to do something broken in the format I'm looking at this as a potential like turn three play too, right? With how modern is and how it like it could just be a, like a turn turn three uh, drop this and then who knows, right? But there is one drawback and it was already a drawback in the other formats, but it matters more here than ever, right? Because in modern, what is that four mana? Jace the Mind Sculptor, right? These things that win the game. This does help you accelerate your mana, all that, but this does not win you the game. Um, like, I do worry that there's a world where we just play this enchantment and then we get tightened and then we die. Simple as that. I mean, that, that is definitely a concern. Modern is a fast format and, uh, there is a risk that if you're tapping out for something that doesn't do anything right away, things can go very poorly, but it might be that it's more of a combo style shell that figures out how to take advantage of it and that, uh, that is the way to go where Yes, you got to take that turn off, but if you untap with it, you're basically going to win the game in one way or another. I think maybe that's the the direction to go with it. So we'll have to wait and see, but I do think that giving everything Delve has got to do some scary things somewhere in the modern format. If it if it isn't broken immediately, it will be eventually. Sooner or later. Sooner if it doesn't uh, take off right away, sooner or later it will do something very powerful. Well. Kind of along the same lines. Let's move on to our number one card, which, <laughs> again, similar to Pioneer, Song <laughs> of Creation. And I feel like this is maybe the format for Song of Creation. It was on our standard list. It was pretty high on our Pioneer list. But in modern, I feel like this is a format. We have Storm Decks. We have actual rituals. We have Manamorphoses. We have so many ways where I feel like if you untap with this, with any reasonable number of cards in hand, you should just storm off and win the game. And maybe if you build your deck in a very specific way, maybe you don't even have to wait to untap. If you can cast a couple rituals, have a little bit extra mana, maybe have your brawl out or whatever and mana morphos and just start chaining immediately. Yep. What do you think about this one, Krim? It's it's pretty disgusting, right? Like the only thing that concerns me is that drawback legitimately, right? Because like how many times uh, have you played like a, a combo deck and you're like, okay, I've got most of the pieces uh, I didn't fully get to go off that turn, so I slightly fizzled. But it's okay, right? Because I, I just for sure win next turn. But You don't get that option with Song yeah, of Creation. <laughs> you don't get that option with Song of Creation, so that is a huge problem for me. Uh, so, like, the turn you're playing this, you're hoping to win then and there, right? You cannot fizzle. This is why, for me, uh, the, the Jeskai enchantment... I feel like it could be a little bit neck and neck because, yes, Manamorphos draws you three cards with this card, and whereas with the Jeskai one, you only draw two cards, right? Because the enchantment itself and then the Manamorphos. But you don't have to discard in the event that you fizzle. Yeah, I think there are more safety valves with Whirlwind of Thought for sure. I think, on the other hand... Maybe there's a deck that doesn't care that much about discarding their cards. We've talked uh, about, like, Arclight Phoenixes. There's yep. Uros in the format. Even Storm decks, you have, like, Past in Flame style cards that you can flashback. And I'm sure you could add more flashback cards into your deck or other things that you can cast from your graveyard if you really wanted to try to minimize the drawback. So maybe that's the other way you could take advantage of this is some sort of just, like, I don't know, Teamer Phoenix deck or Teamer Spellslinger style deck where, uh, yeah, maybe you don't literally win 
win the game that turn, but you're going to get a bunch of value from your graveyard anyway, so you don't really mind if you have to discard your hand. It does mean, though, that you are now... Because let's not lie here, we know Modern is very, very uh, on it when it comes to hating out the graveyard. That means now you're folding even more to rest in pieces and, like, Leyline of the Voids, right? That... That is also, that is also a concern. Graveyard, similar to Titan's Nest, Graveyard Hate does really cause a lot of issues. I think the other possibility though is, and something I'm excited to uh, try with this, is play a bunch of cheap spells and just kind of combo off that way. We have Burning Tree Emissaries, we have Ornithopters. We've had combo decks in the past that are built around Glimpse of Nature, which is just one green yeah. mana. Whenever a, you cast a creature spell this turn, you get to draw a card. And there have been legitimate, like, top tier pro tour winning decks built around those style combos like elf ball style combo decks song of creation might have some potential there as well elves are a tribe that makes ton of mana can get this on the battlefield quickly we do have those mana producing creatures which are essentially makes netting a ton of your mana back mana. and draw you cards so maybe there's a there's there's just so many possibilities with this card like i could see storm decks i could see these like creature combo decks i could see it played like even semi fairly if you could build around your graveyard stuff so i think that's what makes me so excited for Song of Creation is I feel like it's one of those cards that just has like 20 different decks I want to build and try with it. Will all of them be good? Probably not, but if just one of them is, I think it'll be very good because of this card's power level. Yeah, if there is a deck that can naturally just slot this card in, it will be broken. Yeah, I mean, just drawing two cards every spell you cast is a really scary line of decks. It, it is important that like that additional land drop is a way you can kind of maybe get away uh, around discarding your hand. Like, if you play this for four mana, you can immediately make one extra land drop to get up to five mana, and that's where, if you got a, like, Goblin Electromancer or Baral, you can cast that mana Morphos, and then you're just, like, off to the races, and probably going to win the game from there. So I think there's ways that maybe that extra land drop is really important to the combos this enables. Yeah, I definitely could see, like, I maybe, maybe the reason why we can't think of it yet is because it doesn't go into a pre-existing deck it'll just spawn a new one like we had talked about right like and and when that deck happens it will be broken yeah it definitely uh again and we kind of said this in pioneer as well definitely the card that i think on the list might be most likely to end up being like banably good or something if anything from the set is going to get there to that level in modern this is a card that i could see like oh my goodness everyone's playing this it's the best thing going on in the format if anything from my core is going to be like that in modern i think song of creation or or Yarion would be my okay, pick. Okay, well, maybe I was thinking the Jess guy enchantment, but sure. <laughs> like, I guess Yarion is a close, like, ninth. Um, so, like, I, you know what? Maybe this or the Jess guy one is what breaks Storm Chaser Mage and Sprite Dragon. Ooh, you could make a pretty big Sprite Dragon with your Manamorphoses as you're drawing cards from Whirlwind of Thought or Song of Creation. That's for sure. And you're just going off and you're drawing tons and tons and tons and tons and you're just firing off all these spells. And now you've got a bunch of big creatures. Also, we we do have Thassa's Oracles. So maybe you just, like, try to draw your entire deck and play Thassa's Oracle. That could also maybe get yeah. the job done. Or, or, like, yeah, like, you can now go, like, what? Or, no, no, because most of the... You could play all, like, the Cheerio stuff, but I don't know if that works, if you'd want to do that. Yeah, I mean... Ornithopters are not the most powerful cards, but when they're drawing yeah. two cards, like, turning your Ornithopter into a Mull Drifter, that might be good enough. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, anyway, I think that that brings us to the end of our top 10 Ikoria cards for modern. So, uh, let us know what you think. Let us know in the comments. What cards from Ikoria are you most hyped about? What do you think about Yarion? What do you think about these powerful <laughs> enchantments? Let us know. Give us your opinions. Tell us what you agree with, what you disagree with. Krim, thanks so much for hanging out and doing these. It's always a good time. Thank you for having me, as always, Seth. And thanks so much for watching, everyone. So, again, let us know what you think about Ikoria. And we will be back talking some Commander with Tomer in the future. That's our final top ten uh, list that's coming up. So keep an eye out for that in a few days. Anyway, thanks again for watching. Hope you all enjoyed it. And we will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.